financial markets in turmoil. What are the root causes of the financial crisis? The dollar losing value. Heading for its biggest loss in nearly three decades. Will Social Security even be there? I don't know. Buy or rent? That's a very good question. Interest rates? I'm not so sure. Where do you put your money? I don't know. Welcome to the show that answers your questions. This is Follow the Money Weekly with your host, economist, and best selling author. Here's Jerry Robinson. All right, friends, welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. Today, we have a great show lined up for you. This is episode number 418, the title Market Commentary. Today, I'm going to be providing some market commentary. We've gotten quite a few questions over the last few weeks about all the things that we've been seeing. And so today, what I want to do is just briefly provide an update on what we're seeing from the broader financial markets. You know, many of you out there who listen to this show are investors. Many of you are traders. And some of you invest in different asset classes. We have real estate investors here who are part of our membership. We have uh, stock investors, ETF investors, commodity investors, crypto investors, and of course, not just investing, but trading. So you can also trade, not just invest. And, you know, we serve a lot of different types of investors here. And today I'm just going to provide a broad overview of what we've been seeing in the market. So first of all, one of the really interesting things that happened just a few weeks ago is we had this huge week and we talked about it on our last episode when we were talking about when will the Fed begin to uh, cut interest rates. And many people, maybe when that podcast episode came out, they thought, wait a minute, we're just dealing with rising rates. Why will we be talking about cutting rates? Well, because that's how the market thinks. The market tends to be more of a voting machine, if you will. It tends to look at about six months in advance. And so while the consumer well, while even the investor might be uh, mired in pessimism, the market will tend to uh, move past that and look past it and begin to emerge and move higher. Just like when we are in peaks where there's mass optimism and the market begins to curl down well before everybody gets the memo, right? So people tend to get really scared when the market is bottoming. That usually tends to be about the time that it starts to curl back up. Max pessimism in the market is usually uh, reached well after the bottom has already been reached in the market uh, of any particular market, whether it's cryptos or stocks or any of those things. So we had a really big economic week uh, just a few weeks ago where we had the Fed coming out and uh, lifting interest rates by 75 basis points. We also had a another uh, GDP print that came out for Q2 that showed a decline, right? It was a negative print and there was all manner of debate about whether that meant a recession. Now, we believe that it's pretty clear uh, that the economy is in a recession, uh, but we are of the mind that by the time we enter next year, that s some of the problems that we've been dealing with will perhaps have uh, been optimized or perhaps been improved somewhat. And we're already beginning to see that. We've begun to see that with the falling uh, commodity prices, right? So we also got a new CPI print uh, this morning that shows that the uh, CPI grew by 8.5%. That is the consumer price index, the annual official inflation rate in the U.S. It actually slowed, uh, you know, slightly down to 8.5% in the month of July. Uh, that's still near a 40-year high. Obviously, this is still a very high number, but it was lower than the market forecasts of an 8.7% number, and it was certainly lower than the June print that we had of 9.1%. So we're starting to see what we have been talking about potentially here is that we may have peak inflation in the rear view mirror for this particular cycle. Now things can change, right? Things can certainly change and evolve. So nothing is in cement here. Instead, we have to remain flexible. But right now it does appear that the inflationary pressures that we felt that was dramatically uh, aggravated by rising fuel costs and food costs seems to be subsiding. Now, this latest July print that we got from the inflation rate, the CPI, shows that food prices were still up for the month year over year, but that, of course, gas prices, fuel prices had come down. So that really helped 
bring the overall average down. So CPI, or inflation, we are certainly monitoring that and noticing that we appear to have put in a peak number in June at 9.1%. So if we go back above that number and say August, September, October, then that means that you know we are not uh, at the place of peak inflation. But right now, all things being equal, it appears that we are moving that direction. Now, we're also moving you know, next month into a, a historically tough month. So right now, we are recording this in the month of August of 2022. Well, next month is September, right? And after all of the crazy stuff that we've been through with the market over the last couple of years, you really just don't want to be pulling into the month of September, right? Uh, after all of this chaos, after all of this pessimism, after all of these concerns. So what we're facing here now as we head into the month of September, of course, is one of the most difficult months, historically speaking, for the stock market, right? This is the time whenever you tend to have those breakdowns in the market. September is a really important month anyway, because it's the month where, you know, summer is over. Uh, people kind of get back into the groove of things. They prepare for Q4. They prepare for the holiday season. They're kind of getting back in their groove. Many investment managers come back from holiday and they're rearranging client portfolio. So September can be kind of raucous uh, in the market. And that's why we often see a lot of movement in that month. It doesn't mean that we're going to have another, you know, massive decline in September just because we have had poor performances in the month of September. We just want to know, historically speaking, that next month is September, and that could be a uh, thing to watch uh, as we are moving forward. And it, it's difficult to imagine that we really have seen the low in the stock market for this particular cycle. Even if inflation has peaked, there still are several other factors that could weigh on the market and prevent it from just, you know, forming a V-shaped recovery, which again, I don't think is the most likely outcome here. But at the same time, the market has certainly been rebounding in Q2. We had one of the worst first halves in the stock market that we've ever had. I mean, it was brutal, right? The first half of 2022, if you were invested in stocks or cryptos, you know, or, you know, other uh, financial assets like bonds, Wow, right? It was a meltdown in Q1. But ever since Q2, the second half began at the beginning of July, we've really seen a very strong rebound, a very strong rebound, in fact, to the place where we've already seen the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, the Dow Jones, they've all moved back into what we call position uptrends. That means on the weekly chart, they are they are firmly locked in an uptrend. And we've had, you know, things that are buoying this market, right? So you have uh, action in Washington. We obviously have the Inflation Reduction Act, which I want to talk about briefly. We'll talk about that in a minute. We've also have had better than expected jobs reports, right? So that's also been helping the market. We've had this continued decline in crude oil prices, you know, and plus you just had this almost max pessimism. I mean, everywhere you look, you know, great fears uh, about what's been happening. And we talked about this last week. I don't want to belabor this, but the reason why we're struggling with the situation that we're struggling with now is because we didn't take our medicine in 2020. But the market has also been boosted by better than expected uh, Q2 earnings so far. So far, the earnings results have uh, supported this rally, you know, in the stock market here in the United States. We're having the best earnings run right now on the S&P that we've had in the last 25 years. About 75% of stocks or companies have exceeded or beat analyst estimates. Now, that's lower than the 87% for the whole season a year ago, but it's still very similar to the pre-pandemic average. That's according to some Bloomberg data there. So overall, we have seen earnings defy expectations, and that has also helped you know, the market to remain in a rally mode. We've also seen mortgage rates pulling back, which has also been very helpful since reaching a 13-year high of about 5.8% back in June. Again, June was the looking as if it is now uh, one of the peak months we'll be looking back at unless we go higher here, which we could. Again, this cycle doesn't have to be over for higher rates, higher energy prices. In fact, energy prices could certainly go back up. But as far as peaking, Will they go back above where they were in June? That remains to be seen. Uh, and right now, uh, when you look at the uh, the rate on the 30-year mortgage, it just recently fell below 5% for the first time since April, right? So what I have been telling our members here, what I've been telling our 
folks on our coaching calls that we do live coaching calls, our Robinson report that we put out each uh, weekend. We have a video and a PDF report that goes out for market commentary and market uh, charts and, and comments. What we've been telling our members is the fact that we're just simply living through another period of perceptions about the U.S. economy going from bad to less bad, right? That explains the current rally in stocks, even in cryptocurrencies. I want to talk about cryptos here briefly also in a few minutes. But um, we were telling our members to take advantage of the depressed prices earlier this year. One of the things that I feared for our own members throughout all of this chaos in 2022 is the fact that the volatility would cause them to not stick with their long-term investing plan. That's one of the problems that often happens. And I explained to our members back, you know, when I was, when we were talking about this, that, you know, that was one of the big mistakes I made early on was that I was scared by the very first, you know, I started trading in the mid nineties and the very first major, major sell-off I saw was the dot-com bubble, right? And I was scared and I didn't know how to handle it. And so I literally just sold out and looking back, you know, you could have bought amazon.com for, you know, 15 bucks, you know, you could have bought uh, Microsoft for a song, you could have bought, you know, many of these, uh, you know, companies now that dominate, you know, they were all, you know, cut down to size back in the dot com bubble as many in the crash. And that was an opera in that fear, I, I joined the fear in that dot com bubble, instead of looking around and turning over rocks and saying, where's the where are the deals here and taking advantage of the opportunity to invest at lower prices. I instead ran for the hills, right? With most people, you know, back in the dot com era, that was like 2001, 2002. Now, that's what I don't want to see from our own members. And I try to help others learn from my own mistakes, you know, of, of investing and trading over the last 25 years, unbelievably, it's hard to believe. But, you know, th that's one of the things you don't want to do. You want to develop a long term investing plan and you want to stick with it, right? You have to invest. You just simply have to, you can't put your money in a, in a jar and put it in the backyard, you know, and bury it. You're not going to get ahead that way. You have to invest. You have to preserve your purchasing power. And you don't have to invest in stocks. You don't have to invest in commodities. You don't have to invest in all of these different assets. But, you know, you have to find something that you're going to invest in, right? You have to invest in something. And for me, a portion of my investment dollars goes into stocks. A portion of it goes into commodities. A portion of it goes into real estate. A portion of it goes into cryptocurrencies, right? Not all of it. We don't go all in on any one particular thing, which means that we have a balanced portfolio across many various asset classes, which is what we've been teaching now here for, you know, a long, long, long time. It's in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, the importance on having a well-diversified portfolio across various asset classes, not just stocks, not just real estate, not just commodities, not just cryptocurrencies, right? And this is a battle we, we are constantly fighting uh, in educating people on how to get ahead financially, is that many of the folks who have been hurt the most over the last several years have been those who have gone all in into one thing, right? One thing. Just putting all their money into one thing. It's not a smart way to go. It's just not a smart way to go. So we're living through this time period where things have been bad, right? And they're getting less bad. And when you move from a bad to less bad perception or environment, there's a lot of potential gains that you can take advantage of in that environment. And that's right where we are right now. Now, one of the reasons why things are going uh, from bad to less bad right now, just one of the reasons, is because Washington is beginning to finally move on some important issues that it needs to move on. And this is often how Washington will respond to these kinds of lulls in the market is they will pass a bill and that bill will often spark new investment, fresh investment and drive the market higher. And that's exactly what we have, I believe, in the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 put forward by the Biden administration. Now, when we talk about the market, there's also something else called politics, right? So politics exists outside of the market. It is something that uh, seeks to influence the market, influence investors, and influence the economy, of course. And in the case of politics, you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which because it was put forward by the Biden administration and because hardly any Republicans voted for it, well, what are the Republicans hoping for with this bill? They hope it crashes and burns. They hope that it destroys the economy, right? They hope that it's terrible because they didn't vote for it, right? They don't want it to succeed. They didn't vote for it. And so we live in an, we live in an economy, we live in a, a world, we live in, an, in a nation now that's so divided that the success of, or failure of the economy now is literally 
a, a card that is held in the hands of politicians, right? So they want to see, uh, Republicans want to see Biden fail. Uh, they want to see the Democrats fail. The Democrats want to see the Republicans fail. This is a dangerous environment for you and I as investors, right? So again, I don't take a political side. I think both parties are just crazy. I think they're both nuts. They may have good points here and there, and they may have you know negative points here and there. But I think overall, the sum is that these parties are tearing apart the country. Right? They're tearing apart the country. And if you look back, I don't want to make this about political parties, but just real briefly, if you look back at the founding fathers uh, and listen to their words, guys like George Washington, even in his farewell address, warning against political parties, right? Which now people are you know strong, strongly Republican or strongly Democrat. And it's dividing the country. And this is what the founders had warned. They said, these political parties will split you apart. Don't do it. Right? So I think there is some wisdom there in the words of our founders regarding political parties. But nonetheless, here we are, 2022. Republicans want to destroy Democrats. Democrats want to destroy Republicans. They both view them, uh, the other party as being the, the whole reason why the country is in bad shape. And so if you if you get out of that mindset, again, you don't want to think like that as an investor. I've often told you don't invest based upon your politics. It's a wrong way to invest. In fact, I heard Warren Buffett, I've been saying that for years, and I didn't know that that was uh, something that Buffett had said. And I heard Buffett on one of the annual com uh, you know conferences that he does with Berkshire Hathaway, and he was saying, yeah, you know, if you invest with politics, it's a bad idea. And he gave some anecdotal evidence and some stories and whatnot. But the point is, is that I totally agree with that. Don't confuse your investing with politics. And I think in the case of the Inflation Reduction Act, here we have a 15% corporate minimum tax being imposed upon companies that earn at least a billion dollars or more. Uh, prescription drug pricing reform, this is going to help senior citizens uh, so much. There's so many senior citizens right now that are paying outrageous amounts. They're on Medicare. But they're paying outrageous amounts of um, out-of-pocket spending for prescription drugs. And this new bill means that there will be a 2000 per year cap on Medicare enrollees' out-of-pocket expenses for prescription drugs. It'll also allow Medicare to directly negotiate prescription drug prices with drug makers uh, for some of the most expensive prescriptions, which is big. So you have the corporate minimum tax. Uh, again, affecting companies with at least $1 billion in income. They're going to apply a 15% tax rate to their, what they call their book income, which is often how these corporations are able to skate and not end up paying any taxes or an effective 0% tax rate. So they're doing that. They're also to enforce uh, these this 15% corporate minimum tax. They are uh, raising the amount of IRS tax enforcement. So they're hiring more IRS tax agents to uh, focus upon this 15% corporate minimum tax and to go after those uh, higher income individuals who are you know, not paying their fair share, uh, as, as Washington would say. There's also a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks. That doesn't really bother me too much. I know many people are outraged that there would be any kind of tax on Wall Street. You know, I'm not that way. I'm, I, I don't defend the rich. It's not something that I spend my time doing. I don't really particularly care, uh, you know, about defending the rich. So if they're going to pay 1% tax, you know, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. And even if it ends up, you know, trickling down and harming my portfolio by some factor of a percentage, it doesn't, I'm not up in arms about it. So I don't particularly care if rich people pay more money in taxes. It's not breaking my heart, believe me. Now, uh, and some people would say, well, Jerry, if they raise taxes on the rich, it's just, well, no, I, it just doesn't keep me up at night. You know, it just doesn't keep me up at night. When, when companies like Amazon.com pay 0% effective tax rate, it doesn't keep me up at night, right? I'm not worried about the rich keeping their money, okay? It's not something that bothers me. It does, it's not something that keeps me up at night. It's not something that I worry about. Uh, so the, with all that being said, we now have this Inflation Reduction Act that also uh, not only raises revenue through a 15% corporate minimum tax, prescription drug pricing reform, and IRS tax enforcement. They were trying to get a carried interest loophole, by the way, through uh, the Senate. And the holdout was uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema, a Democrat from Arizona. And she agreed to the overall bill, but she definitely did not want the carried interest loophole that allows wealthy hedge fund managers to pay a lower tax rate on their income to be, you know, removed. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> fighting for the hedge fund managers, you know. Uh, who who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk that that's what you do when you go to Washington? You got to fight for those hedge fund managers. Well, that's what that's what she did, and so that part was removed. That part uh, would have raised around fourteen billion dollars, according to the Congressional Budget Office estimates. But the other interesting thing here is that this bill is going to raise or is going to d- deliver around three hundred and sixty nine billion dollars in climate spending. Climate spending. Now, in particular, what we're looking at here are all kinds of tax credits, tax credits galore. Businesses will get incentives to to deploy lower carbon energy sources. They're going to get tax credits for producing and investing in wind energy technology, solar energy technology, geothermal energy technology. Also, the uh, tax credits for battery storage and biogas. Uh, it also extends to nuclear energy and hydrogen energy coming from clean sources. So there's also going to be tax credits for that. There's a little provision in there for your, for the nuclear industry, which I think is very positive um, because even though it's highly contested, that is a cleaner form of energy uh, that the United States has really spent quite a bit of time investing in over the years. And so this is a good good thing to see, I think. Uh, also, consumers are going to receive tax credits on rooftop solar. So you can install rooftop solar uh, at your residence or heat pumps or small wind energy systems. The consumer is going to receive about a 30% tax credit through the year 2032 for about 10 years. And then after that, the credit phases out uh, slowly. I think it goes down after that. But out to 2032, it'll be a full 30%. So if you want to have a rooftop solar system put in, you get a 30% tax credit. Then you also have tax credits for those who are buying electric vehicles. This one has some potential problems with it that may make some vehicles not actually qualify, which simply means that those vehicles will need to be manufactured in a way that is uh, cleaner. But the tax credits will be up to $7,500 for those consumers who are buying electric vehicles. So we think there's going to be a push there towards the electric vehicle space. Now, remember, when it comes to electric vehicles, Tesla is the leader in the space, but many people don't want a Tesla, right? Uh, they want a Ford F-150, right? They want a, a Chevy. They want a Chevy truck. Well, the point is, is that Chevy and Ford and all of these, these, all of these guys are moving heavily towards electric cars. They know that it's the future. And so electric cars are going to be all over the place 10, 20 years from now. It'll be commonplace, right? Well, right now where we live, we're still living in this fossil fuel economy where it's dominated by it, but the government is pushing incentives. And this is exactly how the economy shifts is through these kinds of tax credits. This is exactly how you get people to change their behavior, right? So you're going to have tax credits galore. Uh, Even if you're buying a used electric vehicle, you'll still get, I think, like a $4,000 tax credit for that or up to a $4,000 tax credit. Um, So there's a lot. I could go on and on and on. There's lots and lots of stuff here uh, in this particular bill. But that is also is going to help, I believe, bring this economy and the stock market in particular, I should say, which is not the economy, help remove some of the pessimism that we've been dealing with here, right? So we have the Inflation Reduction Act. We have the latest CPI numbers, which show that it appears we have hit peak inflation, at least for now. That could change. And the market has been uh, you know, responding fairly well. I want to talk about cryptocurrencies, but before I do, let me just go through and talk about a few, br- uh, briefly about a few markets, like the S&P 500, for example. Right now, we're looking at a resistance level of about 4,300, which also coincides, by the way, with the declining 200-day moving average on the S&P. So if you get a breakout above 4,300, 4,350, say, on S&P 500, that's going to be very meaningful. Uh, but the, the support zone here for the S&P 500 is anywhere between 3,800 and 3,650. That area there, if we go back and test that area and actually break down below that area, well, that will be, a entire, it'll be an entirely different story. Um, but if you look at the overall employment, we talked about that before, we've already gotten back to, the, uh, to break even. So the economy now has recouped the number of jobs lost in the wake of the pandemic, uh, which, you know, certainly boosting feelings about the economy, right? And also perceptions about the economy. So every single one of these data points that come out, they have a, a small impact, sometimes a big impact on consumer sentiment, on business confidence and all of this. 
The NASDAQ is also something we're watching closely right now. We follow QQQ, which is the ETF. We've been watching the $315 resistance level. We broke out above that, and now 340 is the upper edge of that, uh, what we would call a resistance area or even a supply zone where you're going to have you know people often selling in that range. QQQ has a tremendous support level at 270, about up to about 295. That's really the, the uh, support zone there on QQQ. Uh, gold also uh, perking back up uh, after some of the uh, economic data we've seen come out. Gold is holding well above its 1675 support level. That is a major, major level, but watch out for 1875 on the upside. I mean, there's just going to be a wall of resistance in that range all the way up to about 2000, even up to 20. 75. I mean, it's there is overhead resistance here for gold. Uh, also, silver has retaken its key 30 day moving average support area. It retook that area and it's been holding above that, but you need to watch support at around the $18 level. There's immediate resistance at the 2150 area. That would be a key area to watch as well on uh, silver. And when it comes to oil, oil has also pulled back to its 200 day moving average and then some. It's been falling now. Crude oil, as of this recording, sitting West Texas Intermediate sitting at about $89. Brent crude, about $94.50. Uh, and gas prices are well, well off their highs that were set back in early June. Uh, they're trading you know, much, much lower than where they were, as is heating oil. Natural gas still a little elevated from its uh, July lows or June lows. Uh, ethanol is down in, in its price. I mean, if you just look across the board, and we've had a lot of pullback in commodity space, which again has really supported the rally here that we've experienced. So we've had a really nice rally. All right. So uh, on the other side of this break, I want to come back and talk a little bit about the crypto space uh, before we close out. So hold tight. I'll see you on the other side of this break. And follow the money returns after this. Hey, friends, Jerry Robinson here from Follow the Money Radio. You know, many of you who listen to our podcast regularly may not know that we have a membership that you can become a part of. You can actually become a gold, a platinum, or a silver member here at followthemoney.com. And when you become a member, not only do you get access to a tremendous amount of resources, but one of the most powerful things that many of our members report is our daily newsletter that we send out. You know, right now, if you're not getting our daily email newsletter where I, you get my commentary and my latest uh, trading idea, you're missing out, especially right now uh, with all the things that are happening in the economy. We also have a weekly coaching call for all of our gold and platinum members, providing them an hour-long live mentoring call with myself personally where we go over what's happening in the economy. We may even uh, provide, you know, some sort of course. Uh, we cover all kinds of material in those live Tuesday morning coaching calls. Then, of course, they're archived forever for all of our members to go back in and watch. So we have so much here to offer, uh, so much more than just the podcast. So if you're interested in learning more about our services, go to followthemoney.com forward slash join. Take advantage of our summer sale. No coupon code is required. Just simply join, check it out. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. I think you'll absolutely be surprised at all of the great resources that are waiting for you right here at followthemoney.com. Followthemoney.com forward slash join. Summer sale, no coupon code required. 25% off all of our memberships. I hope to see you on the other side. All right, welcome back to the program, friends. Jerry Robinson here, economist, author of the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and founder of followthemoney.com. Great to have you here today. It was the best July for the S&P 500 index since 1939. We just went through it. We just had a wild couple of years, didn't we? But July, the month of July was the best month, best July, I should say, best month since 2020 for the uh, S&P, but the best July since 1939. You talk about some wild, wild market times, right? The old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Do we ever, huh? Do we ever? 
Okay, so we talked about the stock market broadly uh, in the first segment. I, in this very brief but second segment, I want to focus on the crypto market. Cryptocurrencies have finally begun to break through in the institutional world. The biggest story we've seen in some time came just earlier, I guess it was last week, when BlackRock, for those of you who don't know, BlackRock, the largest institutional player in the world, when it comes to institutional money, has partnered up with Coinbase to give access to cryptos to its institutional investors. Right? So BlackRock, here's the headline, BlackRock to offer crypto for institutional investors through Coinbase, Coinbase Prime. Um, now, this is something we were talking about many years ago. We began talking about cryptocurrencies back in 2012, 2013. I had Trace Mayer on the podcast. He was one of the very early adopters of Bitcoin. He was on the phone with me saying, Jerry, you need to buy Bitcoin in 2011, 2012. I finally hopped on the bandwagon about a decade ago and started investing in cryptocurrencies. I only put 5% of my assets into cryptocurrencies. And, you know, it's an asset class that's emerging. It's burgeoning. It's there's a lot of risk there. It's a wild west. There's hardly any regulations when it comes to the companies that are engaging in cryptocurrency uh, and digital asset trading and investing and all of this. So, I mean, there are regulations, but they're not nearly where they're going to be. We're still in the wild west, kind of the 1920s uh, version of the stock market before the 30s came and people lost a lot of money and they said, okay, we want laws for you to protect investors against you know, the fraud that is rife in the stock market back in the 1920s. And so they they did that. Well, we're going to have one of those moments here for crypto, and we're beginning to. I mean, there's already talk about a bill coming through the Senate uh, that would make the, uh, the CFTC, the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the direct regulator of the biggest cryptocurrencies like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's also, as I, I mentioned, a stable coin bill that's being pushed uh, after the August recess which is going to be somewhat interesting to, to watch. So there are there is some movement in Washington around this, but BlackRock's adoption, remember it has $8.5 trillion of assets under management as of the second quarter of 2022, right? It's a lot of money. And this money now is going to have, a lot of it is going to have exposure or access to cryptocurrency through Coinbase, right? Now you got to remember, BlackRock was the one just a few years ago saying Bitcoin is bad, it's not going to be around. They fought it, they fought it, they fought it. And now what are they doing? They're giving access to crypto to their institutional investors, right? So this is a really, really big thing. And this is, this is what we have been waiting for. This is what we've been talking about now for a decade, that eventually institutional investors would adopt uh, at least Bitcoin, maybe not all of the cryptocurrencies. In fact, many of the cryptocurrencies we don't believe are going to be around forever, you know, probably 95% of them or more are going to fail. They're just going to fail. Uh, but there are going to be winners, right? Just like uh, in anything, there's there are going to be winners. And of course, we have been long talking about Bitcoin as one that we think will win. Ethereum is one that we think will win. And there's many others. In fact, we put out a crypto report every single weekend on Fridays to all of our members, our platinum and gold members, I should say. And in there, we rank the cryptocurrencies by trend. And so if you look uh, lately at what uh, has really been trending in our crypto leaderboard, you got things like Ethereum Classic, which was the number one ranked crypto uh, for a little bit now on our crypto leaderboard. Uh, OKB and Quant and Uniswap also up there in the top three, four, five uh, positions. Polygon also up there in the uh, top 10. Uh, so many of these uh, projects have really been doing well since the beginning of July, right? Kind of after that route uh, was kind of over. We also have Bitcoin also, it Bitcoin had pulled back to a really important area on the weekly chart to the 200 weekly moving average, right? That's a really long weekly moving average. But if you if you take the price of Bitcoin and you put it on a weekly chart, and then you apply a weekly 200-day moving average to it, you will find that the price uh, pulls back to that area and has rebounded. It rebounded at the end of 2018 in that big route we had in Q4 2018. It pulled back to that area uh, in the uh, wake of the COVID-19 crisis in March. Uh, it actually went below it, but it actually ended up holding 
at that 200 level and then rebounding. And then now we're back at it again. And we just crossed back above it over the last week or two. So this is a really interesting place for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is still trading, you know, 60 plus percent down from its $67,000 peak reached back in uh, 2021. Uh, we also watch a ratio between the Bitcoin uh, price and the S&P 500 index. That is also uh, well below a number that we like to see. But that means that in our opinion, this is a wonderful time if you are a crypto investor to be continuing to add to your holdings, right? So that's what we're doing. We're continuing to dollar cost average, and we've really appreciated the pullback in prices. I know many people will focus upon how scary the pullback is, but it's more, I think, advantageous to you to think about uh, what am I able to, to purchase whenever these prices pull back? Because as a long-term investor, you know, you're looking for discounts. I mean, you, how many discounts are you going to have over the course of your investing career? Well, you, there is probably going to be several of them, but you have to take advantage of them, right? You have to take advantage of them. And if you don't want to be involved in an asset class, well, then don't be involved in it, right? But if you're going to be involved in it, you have to take advantage of the pullbacks. Ethereum, for example, uh, fighting around 1,700 resistance, it's been kind of back and forth, back and forth. It seems to be actually uh, breaking out above that now. We're now about 1,850. So we'll see if 1,700 can hold here on uh, the Ethereum chart. But the Ethereum chart also very interesting because we're getting ready to have the merge. Uh, the merge is coming up, and that's where you're going to have Ethereum move from the proof of work algorithm consensus algorithm to the proof of stake consensus algorithm, which in essence just uh, requires much less computing power, a tremendously amount less computing power because you're not mining for the crypto. You're instead staking the crypto, and that's how it's secured. That's how the protocol is secured. So we own and stake Ether. Uh, for rewards as a long-term investment. We think the POS merge is going to be very positive. You'll probably get a sell the news kind of event on that. That's probably what's going to happen because we've been rallying now into the news. We began rallying uh, in July off of the $1,000 support level on Ethereum, and we rallied up to now 1700 you know, 1800 1850 So, you know, we've got a really nice rally here over the last few weeks. So when the news actually comes, I think they're scheduled for September 19th or something around that date where they're actually going to officially merge. And when they do, you could experience some selling, you could see some selling, but we expect actually the staking rewards to go up uh, on that. We've been talking about that uh, quite a bit. So there's also, uh, for those of you not aware, Chainlink, Chainlink, which is one of our favorite um, cryptocurrencies. We began talking about that one back when it was less than $2, uh, began adding it. It's also going to be announcing uh, something big later this year, staking. And so Chainlink is one we've been talking about quite a bit over the years. We expect that one to do uh, pretty well as we go forward. So we get the BlackRock offering crypto to inst institutional investors. You have the CME rolling out euro-denominated Bitcoin and Ether futures uh, this month, which that's also very big. It's going to create some demand. You have the Senate bill that's going to basically hand... Bitcoin and Ethereum oversight to the CFTC that's going on. You have uh, as well, you have other issues going on like Cardano is going to, going to be upgrading what they call the Vassal upgrade. That's been delayed a little bit, but there's just been a lot going on here in the space. And we are very bullish on the crypto space long term, not on every crypto, of course, not every crypto is going to survive. Many of them will fail. And I've invested, you know, small amounts of money into cryptocurrencies that have already failed, you know? So, I mean, it's, we're going to see cryptos fail, but which ones are going to survive, right? Well, we don't know, but that's how investing works. You know, we don't know when you're investing in growth companies, for example, in the stock market, you don't know if it's going to really succeed or really not succeed over time. You're, you know, you are, that's what investors do. They, they seek out good opportunities, use the best judgment they have and go forward. Well, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, you know, it's it's very similar, except the fact that you do have a lot of unknown variables here in the crypto market. So it does make it more risky. That's why we only put 5% of our investment, investable assets into cryptocurrencies on a regular basis, because there's so much more risk. And we're not willing to take on all of that excessive risk, um, you know, because it's such a new uh, industry. However, that being said, we are certainly exposed to the space. And if you want ongoing updates on cryptocurrencies. If you say this is a hot market, I have I need to be more engaged in this market. Maybe I'd like to put a little bit of money into the crypto market. Well, you know, again, right now, 
you're certainly going to get a better price than you would have a year ago, right? So now is certainly a better time than other times we've seen to be able to invest. What we call the winter is here, the crypto winter, where, you know, it's kind of out of favor. And that's as from a contrarian play, that's, that's certainly where you would want to be adding. So if you do want ongoing crypto insights, you want our crypto report, just become a gold or a platinum member here at Follow the Money. We have so much for our members. We had just had a member uh, recently sign up and they were blown away by uh, what, was, what was behind the uh, subscription wall. After they became a subscriber, they were like, what? You know, they had no idea that we had, you know, hundreds of videos and all these PDF reports and all of this stuff, you know, all, all of these things that we have that you can download and learn. So no matter what you're wanting to do here, if you're wanting to invest in cryptos, if you want to invest in stocks, ETFs, commodities, real estate, we have resources for you here at uh, followthemoney.com. Well, this has been a great show. And uh, that brings us now to the end of today's broadcast. And as always, I'd like to leave you with a final word. And this time it's uh, spoken by one of the greatest investors of our generation, Charlie Munger, when he said, the ability to change your mind is probably the best life skill you can hope to develop. And that's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. the information contained on the follow the money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes it should not be construed as specific investment advice the views and opinions of our guests and sponsors including tom cloud are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of ftmdaily.com or robinson media group llc jerry robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products follow-up individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations past performance is not indicative of future results you should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on the podcast remember never do your financial planning through podcast or radio it's your money be wise do your due diligence and always consult consult a trusted financial professional before making any any financial decisions.